Good afternoon, ladies and gentlemen. Can I give you a very warm welcome to the Barbican? I've been worried for weeks about saying good evening because normally Doris does a demonstration at night, and of course it's the afternoon, so it's all topsy turvy for us. In fact, it's quite a historic occasion in a small kind of way because it's the first time a medium has ever demonstrated at the Barbican. And in fact, this meeting has been organised in conjunction with Weekend Magazine. I've known Doris now for about 10 or 12 years, and she's quite a remarkable lady. She's demonstrated in various countries all over the world. For example, in, Aus in Australia, she packed the Sydney Opera House on several occasions. Doris has been there three times, I think. And on one trip, she had a private jet to whisk her about from city to city, and programs such as Charlie's Angels were shelved to make more room for Doris on television. Then she's been to, Austra to America and Australia, all over the place. I often speak to Doris on the phone, uh, most days in fact, and I always marvel at how she copes with her lifestyle because she's always busy, always doing something. Somewhere along the line, and I don't know how she's found the time, Doris has written five books and the combined total sales so far are a staggering one and a half million copies. Now that for a lady who'd never written until about four or five years ago is quite astonishing. And in fact, the moment Doris writes a book, it leaps into the bestsellers. It'll stay in the charts for weeks and weeks and weeks. And I believe Doris has just finished a manuscript for her latest book, which will be out in the autumn. I often tell audiences that Grantham in Lincolnshire has produced two very famous, very well-known ladies in quite different areas. One, as you know, is Doris. In fact, they both live in South London, but the other one works at a certain number 10 and is called Margaret, and we don't have her here this afternoon, which will please some people anyway. Last year, I chaired a meeting for Doris down in Brighton at the, at the beautiful Dome Pavilion, which is part of the um, palace down there. And it was an evening demonstration, and when we got there, there were thousands of starlings, and I mean thousands, the, the sky was black with them, and I walked to the stage door, and all of a sudden there was a rather ominous noise. And how can I put this? Let me just say that one of the starlings gave me a very warm welcome all over my glasses and all over my jacket. But I hope this afternoon you're going to give Doris a warm welcome, but in a very different and in a much nicer way. So would you please once again greet Doris Stokes, the lady with voices in her ear. <laughs> Thank you very much. Uh, how many of you this afternoon are new? Are you, am I what you expected? Do you expect me to come on with long dangling earrings? And <laughs> Man, I do have to wear a plain robe to hide a multitude of sins. And those of you that are sitting close enough to me can see my legs shaking. I don't want you to start nudging your next door neighbour and say, she's going, look. <laughs> she's going into trance. You should be so lucky. I had two strokes last year and unfortunately it's left me with a shaky leg. And if I get myself a bit uptight, which I postponed an operation to come here today. So I'm, as I've been in quite a bit of pain this week. But God's good and he's seen me through and I'm here today and this afternoon. Now let me make one thing perfectly clear to all of you that's new to us. There is no death. You can't die for the life of you. So it's no good you gentlemen hanging one on at the weekend and then sun on Sunday morning saying, oh dear God, I wish I were dead because it's an impossibility and unless you're going to join in then it's going to be a waste of your time and our time and the magazine's time for us to be here because it is all that I can't reach up and press a button and say right let's have you you can't do that you've got to, it's all got to be done by love you've got to sh open your hearts and let the love flow out I can't bring anybody back when I was in Australia you know I was doing a TV uh, show with a presenter, a chat show like we are here with Tony and suddenly the man leaned forward, everybody started to titter in the audience and I thought, am I showing me under slip or something? 
and they went on teaching and then, and unbeknown to me they would put a drop curtain at the back and there's weird lights flashing all behind you see and the man suddenly leaned forward and he said tell me Doris what does it feel like to raise the dead <laughs> and I disgraced myself and went into hysterics on television I fell about and when I could get my breath back I said raise the dead lover couldn't raise the skin off a rice pudding <laughs> And that's true, I can't bring anybody back. Only you can do that, and only if they want to come. You've got to send out the love, and you haven't got to be afraid to talk back to me. This is important. You've got to talk back, because I'm a clear audience. I don't see spirit people, I see spirit children quite often, but I don't see adults. But what happens, you see, when you start to talk, I forget all the other people that's here, I forget the cameras or whatever's going on, and all I'm concentrating on is the person I'm talking to. And you've got to concentrate on me and the people that's talking to you from the other side. That way you'll get a good afternoon. And um, I make mistakes, you'll hear me say possibly, I might be talking to someone and going very well and everything's coming right and then suddenly they'll start sharing and say, no Doris, <coughs> no, no. And then suddenly I realize that I've got somebody else in and I say, I made a right pig's ear of that. <laughs> Can you stop and, and start me again on the, a new vibration? So sometimes it's a little bit difficult. But um, how many of you think mediums are queer people? Go on, be honest. How many of you wrote to the magazine? And hoping that to come and, and get a sitting, right? Well, what did you expect to see? or to get somebody that speaks thank you dear because that's what it's all about if I can't and if I can't do it I'll be the first to say it's not working boys and girls we'll have to try again but please God they've never let me down yet and sometimes I'll get sometimes I can get a full address sometimes I only get part of an address sometimes I'll get a surname and there might be two people in the audience this afternoon with the same surname but don't worry about that because I have to work out which one I want because I asked the other side to give me information about that person and this is important you know a lot of people think we are normal you know and when we moved to London we had a cat matey and um, the first name that used to go down in the, in the telephone book when we moved was the vet's number and then the doctor's and one day I, I was packing to go to Australia and I was got a sitter coming and I got a duster in my hand and I was trying to remember and I was picking things up and putting them on the bed ready to go in the cases and suddenly the cat went berserk and he started making the most awful noise and rushing in and out of the room so what on earth's the matter with the cat? So I went in the kitchen to see if he'd had his, John had put his bait for sat and it was there and I put him to it and he didn't want to know so I got some fresh fish out and I boiled that and he didn't want to know and he was still making this awful noise and in the finish I was walking about with the cat in my arms like a baby and a duster and the cat was going meow I thought why don't I ask them upstairs what's the matter so I stood still in the middle of the room and I said is anybody about what's the matter with the cat and a voice came back and said he's got the toothache <laughs> True. so I went to the telephone and I'd never spoken to the vet before and I said, good morning, is that the veterinary surgeon? And the surgery? And she said, yes. And I said, could the vet come to look at my cat, please? So she said, are you a client of ours? I said, no, but you've come highly recommended. <laughs> she said, um, well, he won't be able to come for now and a quarter because he's doing the clinic. So I said, that's right, as long as he comes. So I gave him my name and address. And, where we lived and the telephone number and then she said oh by the way madam any any idea what's the matter with the cat oh yes I said he's got the toothache so she said um, how do you know and I said the spirit people told me and there was a long silence <laughs> and I said have you gone away and she said no who did you say to me <laughs> so I thought well in for a penny in for a pound I said the spirit people told me I said, she said, the vet will be there as soon as he can. <laughs> but the punchline to the story is when the front doorbell went and I rushed to the door with the cat in my arms still making moaning, bless his heart. 
uh, I said, oh, thank God you've come, Peter. And he said, how did you know, Matt? I say, you're not the lady. I said, yes, I'm afraid I am. <laughs> so you see, sometimes you have to be a bit, little bit careful of letting people know what you do because they think we're a bit abnormal and really we're not. We have more fun than any religion, I think, in the whole of the world because we can laugh at ourselves. That's the beauty of it. We can really laugh at ourselves.